Evoking the past, historical authenticity versus gameplay authenticity, and ancient Greece. In his book Unlimited Replays, William Gibbons identifies that game designers often will appeal to what players think they know about music history. In other words, they find a sweet spot between, on the one hand, conforming slavishly to historical fact, and, on the other, alienating players by stretching reality too far. Such practice is common in historical games and can even create new intertextual frames of reference that are brought forward into players' future gaming experiences. The Assassin's Creed series is one example of this phenomenon. With each game situated in a particular historical time and place, the music helps to create authenticity for the player. But the term authenticity in this case refers to the player's expected gaming experience and not necessarily to the historical time and place being emulated. For Assassin's Creed Odyssey, set in the 5th century BC during the Peloponnesian War, the expected game world includes a myriad of references to ancient Greek mythology, geography, culture, histories, poetry, and more. While the game designer Ubisoft is well known for its work with historians to make the Assassin's Creed series as authentic as possible, this authenticity has its limits since the main focus is on creating an enjoyable gaming experience. The music of the game also compromises between historicism and an immersive player experience. For example, Odyssey's composer duo The Flight, in a 2018 interview, explained that they were more concerned about creating an overall feel for the game, rather than aiming for historical reproduction. We listened to a lot of the reproductions of ancient Greek music and drew a lot of inspiration from them, especially in terms of harmony and instrumentation. Of course, we weren't trying to recreate this in our score, as that was the job of the diegetic music, so it was more for vibe and feeling. Nevertheless, despite a focus on feel rather than historical detail, players often cite the game for its perceived historical accuracy. One viewer comment on the soundtrack's YouTube page illustrates this well, describing the game's music as what is worth of admiration and why, as a Greek, respect Ubisoft for, is that many pieces remind me of contemporary Greek music. It makes me feel like home. The scene feels like home for the modern Greek player, not because of its connection to the time of ancient Greece, but rather based on its association with their modern day understanding of place and their expectations of game music styles. This presentation will analyze several musical examples from Assassin's Creed Odyssey in order to demonstrate how the composers evoke ancient Greek for their players. The analyses will compare mode, meter, and texture to isolate features of this pseudo-Greek style, and will further demonstrate how Hades, a game that aims for less historical accuracy, nevertheless incorporates similar musical features. These musical cues both evoke players' expectations of authenticity, but also actively communicate information significant to gameplay. The music of Assassin's Creed Odyssey in many ways differs significantly from its predecessors, not surprising given a shift in emphasis in the plot away from the modern and more towards the historic over the last 14 years. The music reflects this difference. While the earliest games in the Assassin's Creed series folded historical elements into a soundscape that more strongly emphasized digital sounds, Odyssey's style leans instead towards a more acoustic sound emphasizing historicism, and more modern elements such as symphonic instruments are relegated to a supporting role. Diegetic and non-diegetic music in the game share some rhythmic and modal features, but differ in their instrumentation. While the non-diegetic music often includes key elements of epic game sound, including prominent low-register instruments, a rapid continuous rhythmic pulse, and low-register percussion, the diegetic music in the game is scored mostly with voice. The main sources of diegetic music in-game are sea shanties performed by the protagonist's sailing crew, as well as a recurring bard song heard of various city locations. Since the sea shanties form a coherent group of songs composed by a single composer, Yanis Yorgantelis, they will provide a useful subset of repertoire to illustrate some of the recurring features of rhythm and pitch in Odyssey's music. Figure 1 gives the rhythms and pitches for the sea shanty Poseidon God of the Sea. The pieces in D Phrygian mode, established through the repetition of D in the first four bars, as well as the drone voice that enters in bars 9 to 16. Amphipos, she's out, 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 Amphipos, she's out,
The tonal focus shifts to G at bar 17. With accidental C sharp and F sharp introducing some chromaticism in bars 22 to 23. Added E naturals in the section starting at bar 25 suggest a modulation to D aeolian. Rhythmically, while I've transcribed this work in 3 4 due to its repetition of four bar groupings, the word emphasis and syllabification suggest a different accent structure than expected in this meter. As shown by the commas added to the transcription and audibly articulated in the recording, the word grouping creates an accent on the second eighth note of bars two, four, and analogous locations. This disrupts the listener's sense of triple meter, instead creating a sense of shifting downbeat throughout bars one to 16. The offbeat entry of the third voice in bar nine produces a similar accentuation. The final section of the work repeatedly changes between duple and triple subdivisions, another way of disrupting regularity in this song. This is surprisingly consistent with what scholars currently know about ancient Greek musical practice. As M.L. West states in his book Ancient Greek Music, in the 5th century BC, for the Greek composer of vocal music, his rhythmic system was additive, built up from units of fixed size, as opposed to the divisive principle of Western music, in which the constant is a measure of time, a bar, that may be divided into fractions of many different sizes. West also indicates that it was common to mix rhythmic groupings of different sizes, what modern listeners would describe as changing meters, which is consistent with the shifting word emphasis in Poseidon, God of the Sea. However, West also indicates that long strings of shorter duration notes, like those that we hear in Poseidon, were avoided in ancient Greek vocal music given the strong emphasis that word stress played in determining meter. Poseidon clearly takes a hybrid approach, using syncopation and rhythmic irregularity, to signal ancient Greek to its players over the type of repeated eighth note pulse commonly used in video game music to signal energy and drive. Texture, melody, and accompaniment in the work are handled in consistent ways that signal Greekness as well. In Poseidon and several of the other sea shanties, second voices often repeat a drone pitch on scale degree 1, such as in bars 9 to 12. Bars 12 to 16 feature a repetition of this drone in the outer voices, with movement in parallel fifths. And bars 17 to 21 further emphasize this tone through a longer duration and repeated semitone motion from E flat to D. Furthermore, the parallel fifth motion introduced in bars 12 to 16 returns in bars 27 to 28, which feature parallel fifth motion with the second voice, shifting to parallel octave motion in bar 29. Tonic drones, parallel fifths, and parallel octave motion are Jorgen Tellis' most common forms of accompaniment in these songs. Other sea shanty examples show a similar drone and perfect fifth harmonization. In Song for a Young Girl, the first four bars begin by emphasizing B, thereby suggesting B Phrygian mode. But this shifts to a focus on E, suggesting E Aeolian, starting with the transposition of the melody in bar 5 and continuing for a remainder of the song. Two voice homophony beginning in bar 6 features an E drone that often creates the interval of a perfect fifth with the melodic tone B such as we see in bars 6, 7, 9, and 19. Does this resemble the harmonic practice of ancient Greece? West gives little detail about vocal harmony in his study, but he does describe some examples of how voice was accompanied instrumentally. In studying a fragment from Euripides' Orestes, he suggests that the notation implies drone tones and the use of concords. In other words, perfect consonances of a perfect fourth, perfect fifth, and perfect octave. Drones are a particularly common choice in modern media to represent the musically ancient, so in this case the history and player expectation may coincide. However, despite this correspondence, other elements of pitch are wildly off from the historical reality. Table 1 lists the major features of mode, meter, and voice interaction within Odyssey's Greek language sea shanty. While we don't have time to go through the full table, I'd like to highlight a few features. The modes used are surprisingly modern. Of the nine songs listed, three occur in modern Phrygian mode, two are in major or Ionian mode, 
five are in Aeolian, or another form of the minor mode. And the final song is in the mode sometimes termed Phrygian major, that is, Phrygian with a raised scale degree three. All of the sea shanties are performed in modern day equal temper tuning, a focus on diatonic scale organization predominates, and microtonal scales are notably absent here. This is contrary to what we might expect from ancient Greek music. While diatonic scales were sometimes used in that time period, the enharmonic and chromatic scale types were much more common. These enharmonic and chromatic scales were constructed from two consecutive tetrachords spanning a fourth. As shown by Weston figure four, while the diatonic scale type was structured via tones and semitones, the enharmonic and chromatic varieties were less evenly spaced, with the enharmonic tetrachord clustering quarter tones and the chromatic clustering semitones at its bottom, followed by a larger gap to complete the framing interval of a fourth. The scales and tuning used in Odyssey are not, however, inconsistent with the practice of modern Greek folk music. Nikos Ortelaitis, in his article The Greek Popular Modes, explains that modern Greek popular or laico modes include elements that emanate from the Makam system, the Byzantine system, and the Western tonal system in harmony. But that over the last century, the microtonal structure of the Makams has been replaced with a Western-based tuning system, partly because of the prominence of the fretted buzuki in Greek folk music performance. Ordelitis explains that, as a result, Greek musicians' conceptualization of scales has shifted in the last century away from a tetrachoral construction towards a diatonic system as favored in Western European art music. He states, Another problematic issue is the fact that Greek musicians think of the dromi as being scales of eight notes, that is, octochords. They teach them in this way, and they also communicate on the music stands this way. Having a look at the few books published by bazooki players verifies this problematic point. All the dromi are presented as being scales. However, the main element of the makam system is that it emphasizes the utilization of the tetrachord and the pentachord rather than the octachord. The importance of the tetrachord and pentachord is true for Byzantine music as well. Obviously, the way Greek musicians treat the dromi reveals a tendency towards Western musical thinking. While microtonal ornamentation is heard in performance, the underlying theoretical structure is taught with a focus on diatonicism. In his interview with composer Duo the Flight, Hector Apostolopoulos acutely observes, The weird thing about ancient Greek music is that practically none of it survives. We might have a grasp of instruments that were predominantly used in the era, thanks to various artistic depictions, but we don't really, really know much about the music itself. If we Greeks were pressed to answer whether any of the flourishes used in your work is ancient Greek enough, we wouldn't really know. At the same time, the lack of information gives you creative leeway, enough room to try and capture a music feel that feels right in the end, and of course can be built upon and used in conjunction with modern structure and cinematic sensibilities. In my view, this is actually the most insightful observation of the entire interview. Since little notated music survives in the historical record, an attempt to recreate ancient Greek music is more guesswork than anything else. Players, the large majority of whom are not familiar with existing scholarship in ancient Greek music, don't really know whether their musical recreations are accurate or not. Lacking that frame of reference, players will pull from their knowledge of other media, their cinematic sensibilities, or as Tim Summers describes, Hollywood. Summers explores this topic in depth in Chapter 4 of Understanding Video Game Music, and he states that music may deploy signs of the real to imply realism and help construct the game world, rather than using music or musical absence that is closer to the actual world sonic reality. Authenticity as understood by gamers thus does not mean reality, but is instead understood as what conforms closest to the expected game experience, and is in the eye of the beholder, whether that be the player, the game designer, the composer, or a combination of all three, rather than being a fixed historical fact. Furthermore, the musical elements that stick out to the player are those that are different from their expectations. Modes, meters, and rhythms, and instruments that differ from the expected gaming norms are thus more likely to evoke the historical past when supported intertextually, that is, by previous media literacy, to create game world. And as a result, those signifiers of rhythm, mode, or instrumentation can still evoke such references even when used in combination with the modern structures Apostolopoulos identifies. One such example is the music from the game Hades. Released in 2018, Hades is a roguelike dungeon crawler based on characters from ancient Greek mythology. With gameplay that focuses on quick battle sequences, the style of music often veers towards rock and metal styles, with heavy electric guitar and percussion. 
Darren Korb, the game's composer, states, For this game specifically, I wanted the writing to have a vaguely Mediterranean vibe, but not too specific, since ancient actual Greek music was pretty weird. I definitely looked at some actual ancient Greek pieces, and they informed the music a bit. Mostly it was the acquisition of some instruments from that part of the world that helped in this department. Lapta, Bazuki, Baglama are the main ones. I wrote and performed the music on a Baglama, so it has a bit of that Mediterranean vibe. But it's more of modern feeling chord progression, I think. Instrumentation seems to be a key signifier of Greekness here, and Korb is aimed for a style that's vaguely Greek but not too specific. Baglama, for example, is similar to the Greek bazooki, but is actually a Turkish instrument. But delving into the music a bit more deeply, several of the Greek signifiers present in Odyssey also appear in Hades' music. Throughout Hades' soundtrack, Phrygian mode and the emphasis on flat-scaled Greek II recurs repeatedly. Tracks such as No Escape, The House of Hades, From Olympus, and Rage of the Myrmidons are all in modern Phrygian mode. Other tracks such as Lament of Orpheus mix flat-scale degree 2 and regular-scale degree 2 to suggest borrowing from Phrygian. And one track, out of Tartarus, appears to be composed in Locrian mode, the other diatonic mode that features flat-scale degree 2. The semitone from scale degree 2 to 1, the presence of flat-scale degree 2 entirely, and the focus on modal melody and harmony become emblematic of this game's musical style. While modes certainly aren't unheard of in rock and metal styles, this particular emphasis on flat scale degree 2 is a bit unusual and sticks out to the listener. Once again, the songs are performed in modern day equal tempered tuning, focus on diatonic pitch organization predominates, and microtonal scales are notably absent. One song that emphasizes Phrygian mode is The Painful Way, a song that plays during the Tartarus and Erebus levels. Figure 5 gives a reduction of its melody and bass line. Centered tonally around C, the melody features a four-flat diatonic collection that suggests C Phrygian mode, strongly emphasizing semitone movement from flat scale degree 2 to scale degree 1 through frequent repetition, which we can see in the melody line quite clearly here. The Painful Way also has other features previously discussed in Odyssey. Although the accompaniment in the Painful Way does not function identically to Odyssey's C shanties, the repeated emphasis on C for three out of every four beats in the bass suggests a similar drone-like effect. It also suggests irregular rhythms despite the 4-4 time signature of the song's transcription. The main melody begins with a repetition of a turn ornament over the span of 3 8 notes, and this suggests a triplet grouping. But then the bar concludes with a duple grouping. This generates a 3 plus 3 plus 2 rhythm that repeats in subsequent bars, suggesting an additive rhythm built up from groupings of different sides, consistent with our previous descriptions of ancient Greek rhythm. Another song, No Escape, heard in the game's main menu, also implies a 3 plus 3 plus 2 rhythm, although this is somewhat obscured through the melody's use of ties. More noticeable in this example, though, is the use of irregular rhythms in meter. If we take the smallest subdivision, the eighth note, as our unit of measurement, the melody in bars 1 to 3 articulates rhythmic divisions of 8 plus 3 plus 4 plus 9. This avoids equal subdivisions of the bar, as well as recurring rhythmic values. Meter changes in bars 8 and 9 add 1 eighth beat or subtract 1 quarter beat, respectively, from the previous 4 4 meter, and this disrupts the music's regularity, instead creating a sense of instability and additive structure once again. The bass voice articulates a constant eighth note pulse, but in bars 4, 12, and at similar repetitions, it changes pitch on a weaker eighth note, a similar shift of accent to that observed in Poseidon God of the Sea. This suggests that both composers view rhythmic and metric irregularity as a feature of ancient Greek music. And might explains Korb's statement that actual ancient Greek music was pretty weird. William Gibbons, in his book Unlimited Replay, states the following. What interests me in particular is how games play with our understanding of music history. Much like the Assassin's Creed games treat history, sticking just close enough to historical fact to fit in with our prior knowledge, yet changing details to create more engaging stories, games often rely simultaneously on our knowledge and our ignorance of music history. The easily identifiable and often entirely made up ethnic flavor of these classical works served as useful shorthand for particular cultures or locations. Gibbon's description is spot on for Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The music sticks closely enough to historical musical practices to provide audible cues of otherness for the player. But given the player's lack of knowledge about the time period, these cues are less about historical authenticity and more about authenticity to previous media literacy or players' current lived experiences. YouTube comments by modern Greeks may indicate a feeling of familiarity and home with the game's music, of music that feels right, 
But this is really achieved through comparison to familiar modern day folk and popular music practices, rather than on the theoretical constructs outlined in the historical documentation. Is that a bad thing? Well, yes and no. While Summer states that such an understanding of history and game can represent history in misleading ways, I would suggest this blurring of boundary encourages game immersion as it removes the obvious boundary of the game's magic circle, the clear border between game and reality. This doesn't mean that players believe themselves to be experiencing reality when playing the game, but that they feel empowered in their understanding of history in new interactive ways and will often seek out new opportunities to learn more about the time period. In Odyssey and Hades, the signifiers of ancient Greekness suggest to the player that their gaming expectations will conform to their historical knowledge, be it accurate or not, providing a framework for contextualizing expectations and supporting effective and immersive gameplay. 